Hello and welcome to this week's episode of It's All Black Academic with your host, myself, Jordan Jarrett Bryan. And this week on the show, I want to have a great debate about Brexit. We've done it um, on season one. I want to do it again just before we get into our panel and our debate for this week. A reminder, once again, all of our socials, we're across Facebook, we're across Twitter and we're across Instagram. Follow us here. Also subscribe to the channel Blackademic TV and if podcasts are more your thing because you're more of a runner, you're in the gym or you're a driver and visuals aren't really easy for you to kind of get to and it's more better in an audio format, follow us on there. We are on Acast. Download the app Acast and you can find us via the search option. It's all Blackademic. Right, Brexit. Let's do it and let's do so. I want to join by uh, Ola here and also Fumi and Femi. Guys, how are we doing? Great. Good. Good. Looking forward to this debate. Yes, me too. Me too. So let's get into it. Um, I must make the point, first of all, that at the point of recording this show, as it stands, we are meant to be leaving the EU on the, or the end, of, uh, end of March, March. 28th of March. 29th, 29th, 29th of March, yeah. even. So that, just to get that in there, I'm sure it's looking like that's going to change at some point in various different yeah. guises. So, but just to make the viewers aware that that's where we are at the point of recording. Um, let me start with you. Yeah. It's a mess. It's a complete mess right about now. Yeah. How do you see this playing out with, with, with a few weeks to go until the proposed date of leaving is uh, upon us? How do you see this mess being cleaned up? It appears that Brexit will be delayed just because Parliament now have the opportunity to vote on that extension. And we know that majority of MPs voted to remain. Um, so uh, for people who voted Brexit, I I'm afraid that the reality of, of Brexit not happening is looking more realistic. Um, so so that that's what it, it, it looks like. Um, and it's I guess it's down to Parliament to sort of decide if they want to do the democratic thing, which is, you know, people have the choice to, to vote for Brexit, and we whether or not we're happy if the country voted Brexit or not, um, the democratic thing to do is to go through with that. Um, so, so that's the choice that Parliament would have to make if they... Um, go with what people voted for or if they um just get rid of what people voted for i hear you yeah. um as someone that works does a bit of pr across all the parties what do you make of the mess that we are currently in and do you get a sense that that parliament understands the frustrations of people that voted both sides of the of the of the referendum yeah very much so i think the problem is, is that Parliament, as you said, is in a deadlock. Mm -hmm. And so they're wanting to kind of fulfill the will of the people that, you know, people who voted for Brexit um, in 2016. But at the same time, PR wise now, it doesn't look that good. The fact that A, they're not really able to carry it out as well as and, and as easy as they would like to. Mm -hmm. But also B, there is a real and present chance that Brexit <laughs> might not happen mm -hmm. at all, or at least be delayed for a significant amount of time. So, you know, publicity wise and very much image wise, all the parties are affected now because at the moment yeah. you have two major parties, the Conservatives and the Labour Party, who are both saying, yeah, we're going to do Brexit and we're going to make this happen. But then they can't agree as to A, what Brexit is and B, mm. when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The only party at the moment that's actually saying something completely different and in quote wants to, you know, um, essentially almost overturn that result in 2016 is the Lib Dems. But obviously the Lib Dems, if you, if you speak to most people within the Westminster bubble, are publicity wise almost I mean they're almost non-existent yeah, because of relevant. what happened all those years ago sure, with that election the, anymore, really. yeah. yeah so I think they're still struggling with that brand image if that makes sense mm -hmm. maybe if they have more of a voice then maybe people might listen to um what the Lib Dems are saying and maybe consider them um election wise mm -hmm. um but the issue is again you have the two major parties both saying they're going to want to deliver Brexit but just at the moment, not it's able not to. Yeah. Um, Femi, you're from uh, Our Future, Our Choice. Mm -hmm. You ain't having any of this. You, you're, you're, you're vehemently <laughs> <It's> campaigning <laughs> to make sure this ain't happening. Okay. Um, a, what do you make of the mess that we're currently in? Mm. And B, how do you see this playing out? I'll get to what I'm asking in a minute, but how do you see this playing out? Okay, so we're in this mess because right now, as an EU member, we have 73 of the 750 members of the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. So when you do the maths, we have about three times the voting power of the average EU country. Now, people voted to take back control, but we just negotiated a deal, which means we follow the rules of the EU, but have no say at all. So imagine voting for more control and ending up with infinitely less. And that's the deal that we've got on the table. So we've got a deal that Brexit voters absolutely hate. We've got a no deal option, which A, 
some of the, some Brexit might be saying they want now, but it was not what was promised in 2016 at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have two options that Parliament can't really afford to vote for. Because if they vote for a deal that both Brexit voters and Remain voters don't like, they're done to the next election. Or if they vote for a no deal which trashes the, the economy, again, they're done next election. Mm-hmm. So the only way they can really wash their hands of it is by having a, a referendum where we say, all right, we've negotiated a new relationship. You didn't like the old relationship. Which one do you prefer? Mm-hmm. So I think we're actually likely to head towards a new referendum where we get to see the deal. Because let's face it, in, Bre- in 2016, Brexit was four words. Leave the European Union. Right now, it's a 585-page treaty. Mm-hmm. It's a significantly it's different deal. Mm-hmm. Um, now, a lot of people that I know were for Remain and would like a people's vote, which I know you're campaigning for, correct? They say, and they're confident from what I hear, that if that happens, they're confident that the, the, the result will be different. A, do you agree with that? And secondly, do you understand the frustrations of people who voted for Brexit who feel that would be a portrayal of the initial result? Okay, uh, in terms of confidence of what to happen, what would happen in a new referendum, if it's between uh, the deal and membership of the EU, I think we'll, we'll stay in the EU purely because if you want, if you voted for more, the fifty-two percent who voted for more control hate the deal, um, so they're not going to vote for that, and the forty-eight who voted to stay in the EU want to stay in the EU, so they're going to vote. For, they're going to stay in the EU. So the math says that if it's between EU membership and no deal. I'm worried because at this point, it has not been made clear exactly what no deal would mean for the country. Mm. Some people even think no deal means no Brexit. So we have, we have had a serious wow. <laughs> lack of information about what exactly no deal means. Because let's face it, if you don't know every single um, piece of EU law, every trade deal that we're, part, that we're part of because we're members of the EU, every system, every framework that gets us drugs into this country, that all ends with no deal. So if you're arguing for no deal and you don't know all that stuff, you literally, and I mean literally, don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the one thing as to what I think um, uh, will happen in, in, in a referendum vote. As for the frustration, we voted by a margin of 52% to turn our 27 closest allies into our 27 closest economic rivals. Uh, nah, I disagree with that, but uh, yeah, I'll let you carry on. Finish your point, yeah. <laughs> you come back, yeah. Um, which means that, I mean, with the narrative around Brexit in 2016 was thoroughly just the EU is the enemy. In fact, you've heard the narrative throughout this entire process is the EU is the enemy. And so we're surprised that they haven't given us mm-hmm. what we want. I mean, the idea that you go into a negotiations with one country against 27 and expect to get exactly what you want to end up on top, which is the situation we wanted. I mean, right now, I said we have three times the voting power of the average EU country come out of the negotiations against 27 countries and, then, and expect to ha- end up in a stronger position is just madness. So why do you disagree that that's I, It's not just the language true. that was used. I think when we sort of sensationalise this debate about, you know, Brexit, just because we leave the EU doesn't mean these other countries suddenly become our rivals. And I think that kind of narrative kind of, it, it damages the whole conversation. And I think we just need to have a bit more of a pragmatic But factually, um, is, is, is Femi correct? I don't think they have to be a rivals. You know, we're not in the same trading block as China, for example. It doesn't mean China is a rival to how we trade or how we do business. It means that we have to create new partnerships, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to, to see ourselves as, as rivals because we will still export um, goods, services. We will still import goods and services. But you know why I disagree with you? Yeah. Because I feel like Femi does have a point in terms of what that narrative is. I think from the... From the minute we were told that there was going to be a referendum yep. up until this very day, in the media, the rhetoric the media. of parliament, yeah. the media, but yeah. also the rhetoric of people in the parliament, the the um, speeches that Theresa May has made after certain negotiating um, talks, you know, there is that feeling and that sense of the EU is them and, you know, them and us, mm-hmm. them and us. And I think people voted accordingly at the time in 2016 yeah. because of that kind of them and us situation you only have to look at some front pages to see that that narrative of them and us is very very strong and yeah. i think people still have that whether you're someone in parliament and um, and or if femi is factually or in or or factually incorrect or correct it's that feeling it's that notion that people yeah. are going on if that yeah. makes sense and that, that you mentioned the media and, and that's the point i'm trying to make if you have the right wing or the left wing who have their own sort of agendas in terms of, you know, painting these narratives. I think 
as because I'm I'm here on my own personal personal capacity as you know I did my research into Remain I did my research to Brexit and I made my own personal decision so I think whenever we see someone in the media or anyone in the media just kind of sensationalizing this narrative of you know anyone who voted Brexit but is it is just racist. the media I, I is think it just it, the media? I think it is the media I think a big part so of it so you don't think it's media. MPs that say certain things as well? well well most MPs are part of that narrative aren't they because you know MPs and the media are very closely aligned you know some MPs have close alliances with certain parts of the media so I think you know if you want someone to vocalize a narrative on Brexit you know an, an MP someone who looks credible to, to vocalize that opinion but i think the key the key issue we have here is that majority of mps voted to remain so to give a body a power to implement something that they don't believe in is a very difficult thing to do to do and i think that's why we're in the mess that we're in um, yeah, just 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 to, just to go on on the issue of uh, have we turned them into our rivals or not just in terms of pure uh, uh, economics i mean i studied eu law and the, the most common um, story you saw played out in the case law is Country X decides to change its laws, which make which give a preference to businesses that are based in that country, so that all, all businesses from outside aren't able to compete. Yep. So the whole idea of the EU was have the same rules across the whole board, yep. so that anything made in one country is legal across the board to lower yep. prices. So you don't have that that internal com um, com competition. Yep. So things that the prices stay low. Yep. And if you look at, for example, with China, the Chinese government artificially give, give, gives um, more money to um, like steel manufacturers mm -hmm. so that they can then export their products into the, into the, into the EU yeah. at an artificially cheap level to, to wipe out industry. So economics is always about competition. So that if we end up on the outside of the EU system, we will be at a competitive disadvantage on our own continent. That's what, that's, that's what we've decided to do to ourselves. Yeah. But so my, well, I guess my counter argument to that is... Um, for me, the EU, as so someone who was born and raised in Nigeria, the EU has almost become like a protective block to anyone outside of the EU. So if you have um, organizations in, from Nigeria who want to import or export to, to, to countries within the EU, actually, it's harder for us to do. And if you have countries in the EU who are more about, you know, we're a globalist um, world now, we want, we want to be international, why, why should we have this state who the majority of people who control this state aren't even elected this this elected so why why should we have this protective block that makes it harder for the rest of the world which are parts of the world who who actually need trade we talk about africa we talk about south america these are parts of the world who need trade so why why should we be so protective about how these countries trade with each okay. other uh, let's, oh. I'll ask that quickly and I'll ask you a yeah so the eu has an everything but arms tr trade deal with 33 countries in africa which mm -hmm. means that anything that isn't a weapon has has zero tariff. Right. The, prote the protection system that I was referring to wasn't about tariffs; it's about having the same rules. Right. Because if you had to make twenty eight different, if if the twenty eight different countries in the EU had different laws for everything, you'd have to make twenty eight different versions of of, the, of your product, and they would they would raise your cost by making by only having one set of rules. It lowers cost, but it also means the businesses from outside of that find it harder because they do have to make different versions of, of their products. Because in the EU. As long as it's made legally in the UK, it's legal across the board. Yep. So there's just an, an an automatic. It's not like they're actively trying to protect their industry. It's just said this is, makes it cheaper. Yeah. And it's it's a system that countries outside that don't benefit from. But why do we think that? Why why do we think that would change? If we become an independent country, um, why do we think for UK would have lower standards of of quality of goods coming to the country? Well, well firstly, that that's the entire narrative that we that we've been that we've been peddling the idea that. The EU has all this red tape. We need to get rid of get rid of EU laws. That was one of the fundamental narratives in the, in 2016. And, and secondly, if the idea is to have different laws, that means, like I said, a business in the UK, if they're if the like okay, it gets technical now. Yeah. This this principle called mutual recognition means as if the EU hasn't made a rule for a certain industry, then as long as it meets the rule that is the national law, like the UK law, then it's legal across the board. Yeah. So, for example, in that particular in that sector like that, a UK product, if we're outside of the EU will have 28 different laws to comply with if it wanted to sell across the EU, whereas an EU company would have to make one version that would be legal across the board. Yeah. We'd be at a competitive disadvantage. And that's not because the EU is trying to punish us, that's just the system that we've chosen to leave. Mm -hmm. um, we did a debate, our very first debate on season one was Brexit and how it would affect Black Britain and the Black community in particular. Um, and I want to touch on that again, because we've got a new panel, so new, new opinions, new ideas. How do you feel? If we do, if we were to leave the European Union, it would impact on black people in this country negatively. I, I think <laughs> it's dual in nature from my 
opinion. So on one hand, you have people like my mother, who is a first generation immigrant. She's built her way up all the way from, you know, the late eighties till now, you know, she voted uh, remain, but she was tempted to vote leave because in her opinion, you know, she's someone who's been building herself for the last 30 years. But then in the last few years, she's starting to see people from the EU take a lot of the roles that potentially ex-Commonwealth as well as British citizens could have. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you have people like that who think, you know, potentially could mean less people from that demographic, i.e. EU, mm -hmm. um, having certain roles or certain contracts in, in, in business. But then on the other hand, it could be, as Femi is saying, economically quite damaging. We all know that the black community in the UK is at a lower social economic um, demographic, you know, generally. So if things go, you know, essentially balls up economically for the UK when we leave the EU, that's definitely going to affect black people and the black community because mm. already we're at a lower social economic demographic. And if we're someone who, if, if, if the black community is a community that doesn't have that much pounds in its pocket mm -hmm. and prices rise, you know, um, people potentially could lose their homes. They won't be able to afford food. You know, it could be very damaging to the black community, potentially, anyway. Do, do, do you agree? Or can, can you think of any other examples, like maybe tangible examples of where our people will be significantly more effective negatively than anybody else? Well, I mean, I'm on Twitter, so yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the abuse that I get is every day. Uh, sorry, it's, I get abuse every, every minute, racial abuse every 36 hours, give or take. Um, and like, there's, a, there's an account with like 70,000 followers that is launching a just like specific racist campaign against me. The narrative has been, we took back control of our country. We took our country back. From whom exactly? Um, the, I mean, the racism that, was, that existed in that campaign is only going to get worse if, if Brexit actually happens, because the idea is we now control it. I mean, you saw, that, you saw Nigel Farage with his, with his breaking point poster when he, when he showed all those um, Syrian refugees. People often say, well, why is that racist? It's just a photo. It's racist because under EU law, we're not part of the EU's common asylum policy, which means none of those people had any EU rights to come here. The only reason why he chose them rather than the people who do have the rights here, like Bulgarians or Polish people, is because they happen to be the color that people that listen to Nigel Farage mm -hmm. actually fear. Mm -hmm. We've had a, it's such a racist rhetoric that it's been legitimized by the Brexit result. And so, if, and so the more, thing, more this goes ahead, I mean, a, a close family member of mine was pushed to the ground within weeks of this saying, uh, well, it's Brexit, you guys, you guys are supposed to get out now. Seriously. In a, in a car park. Oh, oh after, after a, a car park, um, like parking space sort of dispute. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell me a positive for black people that you yeah. think there would be, uh, should we leave the European Union? Um, I, I, I definitely would see it from a more positive perspective. Um, I think um, as black people, we, you know, the, just the focus on, on business, um, looking at opportunities and actually how can we create more opportunities for ourselves? Um, and I think Brexit would, would, if it does happen, it would present that opportunity for us to look at whether it's sort of trade or, um, you know, business opportunities that might come out of Brexit. And I think, um, I, I just think that would be, um, an opportunity for us to just explore, um, th that side of things as well. I do agree in terms of, um, how it might look in the media or personal experiences like yourself. Um, the question I'll ask myself in terms of experience since Brexit happened, do I feel the country's more racist? I haven't personally experienced that, I, I would be honest. But to say that, you know, other people haven't experienced that would probably be a lie. So I can only go based on my experiences that do, do, do we feel that the country is a lot more racist since Brexit happened? I haven't personally experienced that. Um, and racism is a thing that we kind of have to fight with Brexit or without Brexit. Um, so I guess that's my, that's my sort of viewpoint. Do you accept that having people like Nigel Farage and UKIP yeah. driving this, uh, the, the vote to leave the European yeah. Union has been damaging to, 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 to your cause because of, of the people they bring. And the, the, it, well, the irony of it is Nigel Farage wasn't actually allowed to be part of the official leave campaign for those, those specific reasons. So Nigel Farage and, and the far right have kind of hijacked um, the, the narrative for, for Brexit. Um, so, so yeah, I think there is a part of, of that um, I, I don't know everyone who voted Brexit. Um, and, and the irony of it is since we voted to leave, actually, um, immigration from non-EU countries has gone up. Um, so I think we need to control this conversation about the reality that the impact of Brexit would happen because it would create, from my perspective, someone, someone who came from Nigeria, it would create a, a more 
fairer and a consistent uh, level playing ground for for non EU um, residents or citizens. Because as a as a company, as a business based in um, Britain, for example, if I have to choose for from the cost of recruiting someone from France or Spain versus the cost of rec- recruiting someone from India, it's cheaper. It's easier to to recruit, even if they have the same sort of skills. Um, but if if that playing ground becomes a bit more leveled, then actually, um, you know, we can we can recruit f- from from um, you know Ghana, from Nigeria, from South Africa. We can recruit from India, uh, and it just becomes a, a fairer and a consistent play- playing ground for everyone. And I think that's why. I just question when people ha- have this whole view of the impact um, uh, um, Brexit will have on immigration. Because like I said, non-EU immigration has gone up and EU um, e- immigration has actually gone down. Do, do you guys feel that the, the sacrifice of doing what you feel is the right thing to do, i.e. remain in the European Union, is it worth sacrificing long-term d- democratic processes so a lot of people are saying that's a good point. if they if they if they, if if we don't leave i'm never voting again is is, is that a, a, a penalty worth paying yeah. for what you feel is the right thing to do you know i was right. just saying to one of your crew that that's a big dilemma for me yeah, that's so a what? massive dilemma for me personally mm-hmm. because i feel that you know economically where we're just kind of getting back from the financial crash of 2008 you know we're not i guess very strong but we're getting there and there's a potential that, you know, if Brexit does not go as well as we planned, things could not only be as bad as 2008, it could be even worse. And so for me, I have been having that dilemma Mm. of, you know, do we sacrifice essentially our principles of democracy, which is a strong value of the UK. And often we go into other countries imposing democracy. (laughs) So it's, it's, for me, it's almost, it's almost a democratic crisis for me because I don't know whether the economic benefits should supersede that of democracy mm-hmm. but then other people would say well yes it does because one of my really good friends is a brexiteer says that look t- the price to pay for economic instability is worth it to save sovereignty mm-hmm. and to save democracy well, i'm gonna ask you give me an answer do you feel it's a price <laughs> worth paying because there are long-term Ooh. implications but if you genuinely believe that what is most important first and foremost for everybody in this country is staying in the United Kingdom, in the EU, sorry. That's something we've got to just... You see, for me personally, I feel like a lot of the issues that we have in the UK now is linked to economy. Knife crime, any form of crime, different things are always linked to money, the economy, everything, whether it's micro or macro. So for me, I feel like we have to be able to save the economy at, at a high price. Mm-hmm. And I'm almost tempted to say, <laughs> Jordan, I'm, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say, I'm but at the same time, I do get the fact that, that look, democracy is a strong pillar of British values, right? So it's not something that we would want to sacrifice. And I think this is something that MPs have to really consider because at the end of the day, you know, yes, democracy is important, but so is the economy. Look how long it's taken for us to get to the position that we're in now. It's taken so long and we are at an, we're at a cliff edge, you yeah. know, potentially this could really go wrong it could go I, know. I feel i've been mean by allowing you to answer the question when the question <laughs> the, 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 allowing you to answer que- first because the question should have been questioned the, que- the idea that brexit that not having brexit would just de- would destroy faith in, in democracy <sighs> nobody's asking for parliament to simply not do brexit that's not what we're asking for the only circumstance in which brexit stops is if we have a referendum where we have a new ref- where we have a new vote where people declare that brexit should stop <laughs> which means the only circumstance so, so there are, and there are two uh... outcomes there are two outcomes from a referendum Either we vote to leave the we vote to leave the EU, in which case what what's the harm done to democracy, or we vote to stay in the EU, in which case that's the new will of the people. We have elections every five years for a reason because people change their minds because promises aren't aren't met. That that is the situation we're in. But the that's, but that the would be the is- worst. If if Brexit doesn't happen, I think it would be the worst. Thing that's happened to Britain for a long time. But this, I would be but, but, but sure, we, because it's this, the wrong decision or because the, the democratic element of but, it. But it's, so uh, so well just move back to but Nigeria. We're, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, uh, like, even in Nigeria, but we, people we, we, at the moment we, we in are, Nigeria, people whoa. are like complying with the results of elections. But we are talking so it's, about it's. It will be not like the, the country's seen. It's gone through multiple depressions where you know fifty percent unemployment. So this whole logic of like. You know, will be. Yeah, don't get me wrong. In the short term, jobs will be affected, but short I think term, to, in the short to short medium term. term. Okay, okay. But but but, 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 but no, no, we, I we, think we need to be really clear. This is, yeah. this is the point I was making. 
I'm not talking about Brexit simply not happening. I'm right. talking about if we have a referendum. But why well, 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 we, well, we have another so one? My issue is that if we have a referendum, like a people's vote now, mm. do we have a third one? Do we have yeah, a fourth one? Okay, okay, okay. well, when it do we stop? That's the issue. Allow me to fix this. In when they had the Good Friday Agreement, you know the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast yeah, Agreement, yeah, yeah. responsible for peace in Northern Ireland, they sent a copy of the full text of the Good Friday Agreement to every single voter in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and then they had a referendum, and then they signed the Good Friday Agreement. The people, when they signed that Good, when they, when they voted in that referendum, they could see the exact deal line by line, all the, all the pages of the deal that they were signing. What happened with us was we signed the contract in 2016, and they wrote the terms three years later. Mm -hmm. How is that democratic? Uh, it, under what circumstance would you be held to a con the terms of a contract that, where the terms were written three years after, after you, signed, you signed, it. signed it? And that is what's happened here. Now we have the terms, we have the terms here, and it is the Brexit voters themselves who are the loudest voices saying this is not what we voted for at all. Even though technically it is, the, the, the ballot paper said leave the European Union, this still means we leave the European Union. So it is not. it would be completely undemocratic if we end up with a situation where the Brexit voters aren't happy and Remain voters aren't happy. That is, I mean, let's look at this. None of the options are good. Nobody's, nobody's pretending that, that a people's vote solves everything. But our only other alternatives are we leave the EU on, its, on terms that, um, that Brexit voters and Remain voters don't want, so pleasing exactly 0% of the population. <laughs> um, and, or, or, or we leave the EU on a no-deal situation, which was not always promised in 2016. Every single Brexit campaigner said we would get a better deal with the EU. They said, they, um, Nigel Farage said it, Boris Johnson said it, Daily Mail, The Telegraph. The idea that if we'd, vote, if we'd have campaigned on let's vote to leave the EU and leave with no deal in 2016, that they would have still won, the margin was 2% under circumstances where we were told we would get a good deal. The entire narrative of they need us more than we need them was based on the idea of they will give us a good deal because of how much they need us. So, so let me ask you, I know it's something you do not want to entertain or think about <laughs> and even fathom happening, but let's just say we do leave the European Union, be it this month, next month, whenever. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going you, you, to move back to Nigeria. My, <laughs> no, I mean, we're laughing, but <laughs> my, my, my plan was, al was always to basically do my best to avoid uh, um, the disaster of Brexit. Mm -hmm. And then if I fail, try and stop us from moving too far to the right. Mm. That, was, that was my plan. Um, because right now we've got a government that is actively hostile towards human rights and people from other countries in general, mm -hmm. hostile environment. Um, and we've got... Um, the, the protections that the EU provides in the, on that basis have been removed. They now feel they can do whatever whatever they like. They, they, they want to, and the first thing they, they wanted to do after the Brexit vote was to turn us into a corporate tax haven to keep businesses. The rights that have been hard fought over the past 40 years are very much on the chopping block now with this, with this government. Mm. Um, let me ask you, what do you think, again, should we leave the European Union will be the first tangible and noticeable thing we will see happen in this country? What's the first thing you think we will, in the first six months after leaving, what's the first thing you think we will, we will notice and see? Well, I think it, it definitely depends on if we have a deal or not. Yeah. So let's just say if we have a no deal situation, mm -hmm. Michael Gove himself, the Environment Secretary, mm -hmm. he said about a week ago on the Andrew Marr show mm -hmm. that food prices will go up. Oh, yeah, yeah, this I'm is sure. a strong Brexiteer. He yeah. said that on the Andrew Marr okay. show a week ago. So that's the first thing people will notice. So our shopping, our groceries, shopping, our groceries will grow up, grow up straight away. Because you have to think about it. No deal means tariffs now between the different countries. Mm -hmm. For example, I was speaking to one politician this week who was um, explaining to me that they went to visit the Ford plant in Dagenham. Mm -hmm. They make the engines there. Mm -hmm. So when they make the engines, they now send the engine over to like the body of the car to an EU country. Then that car will now come back, back to the to UK yeah. and potentially be sold out each time back, forth, back, forth, back, forth tariff, 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 yeah, tariff. Yeah. So car prices could go up. Yeah. So I think the first thing people will see if there's a no deal situation mm -hmm. is, you know, general things that we buy could go up. If there's a deal, depending on what the deal is, we might not see that much of a shock because we have the transition period. But um, again, Long it just depends. It just depends. Who knows? Who knows? No one knows. No one knows. No one really knows. Okay. If, but we, we know what happens if there, if there is the two options. If it's, if it's the deal, then like you said, for the first two years, nothing really changes. However, if it's a no deal situation, then we have to go back to the basis of what exactly is our current deal. Mm -hmm. Right now, anything made in this country is automatically legal across Europe. And no tariffs, no difference in regulations, no, no need for checks at the border, no extra cost, no, no delays. Which means that right now, the UK is a valid place of European distribution. For example, there's a Nissan factory that sends 70% of its cars to mainland Europe. 
and 35,000 jobs in the Northeast depend on that factory. Now, if there are different laws, if there's a, if there's a tariff, a tariff cost crossing that border, that means that 70% of their cars will face an extra cost. Mm-hmm. If that factory were, for example, to move to Frankfurt, then only 30% of their cars would face that cost. Now, over the long term, it's going to, businesses like Nissan, like Honda, Japanese companies will see that it makes more sense if they want to get, get their cars to, to the whole of Europe to base it in the largest market, which will be the EU and not us. So those jobs in areas specifically that voted for Brexit are the, ones, the are the ones that will be the, affected the do you, most. Do you accept that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think yeah, job losses are, um, will, will, will be something that happens. But at the same time, the question is, as a country, what do we do really well at the moment? And car manufacturing is, is one of those. I don't think that's going to change. For now. For ne- well, for now. <laughs> I, I still don't think that's going to change. IT and telecommunications is, is one of our, our biggest exports as well. Is that going to change after Brexit? Probably not. Um, so, so I think we don't give this country enough credit for the expertise that it has. Um, and yes, there might be job losses, but at the same time, jobs will be created because we have to look for opportunity, new opportunities. We have to. Can, let me, look, let me just say yeah, after that, Joe, because I also have a personal, um, experience of this. You know, yes, we're looking at what will happen after the 29th of March, but things are happening right now. Me personally, I, I was meant to get a prescription for something from my doctor. Mm-hmm. My doctor says she's not able to give me this particular prescription because the pharmacies can't get it. I said, why can't the pharmacies get it? She said, because the wholesalers are stockpiling. Mm. That's well, real uh, issue. Uh, uh, and, Do you know what I mean? That's that's scary. When she said that, I was um, like, are you for yeah, real? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't yeah, yeah. believe it. And you for know? me, that's, so, the, that's one of the biggest, um, well, I don't, I don't like using the word betrayal, but betrayal yeah. of Brexit voters. The idea that they were promised that Brexit would make the NHS better. And many of them voted on that basis. And, and a concrete example would be um, the fact that citizens from other EU countries make up 5% of our population and 10% of our doctors. Yep. There's Daniel Hanan, who was part of the Vote Leave campaign behind the bus that said there'd be more money for the NHS, mm. now part of an organization that's calling for American firms to be able to buy up and privatize parts of the NHS. Mm. There's the British Medical Association, the highest medical authority in the country, saying that a no-deal Brexit would be catastrophic. On top of that, the, the, Brit- the Royal College of Nurses, the Royal College of Midwives, the Royal College of GPs all say that any version of Brexit is bad. So the NHS, one of the crown jewels of the UK, is very much on the chopping block because of something that people were voted, voted for, believing it would make it better. Make it better. Um, just a couple quick ones I've got to ask. Are you, in your mind and in your heart of hearts, 100% that the better option is to leave the EU? Do you still believe that of the two options, to stay yeah. or to go, leaving, you can hand on heart, you are confident, and if you are, that's totally yeah, fine. No, no, no. But 100% say... I genuinely believe leaving is the better option for this country. I think in the short to medium term, if we had to go on, on that basis, it's, it's definitely not. I think you don't have to be an economist to sort of know that. In the long term, it provides more opportunity uh, for us uh, as a country. Because the reality is, I, I just, I'm just anti-EU because, like I said, it's a selected body. The, the people who make the key decisions in the EU aren't elected. And as a Democrat, I think that's something for us to look at. Um, the EU itself, in terms of unemployment, it's, you know, we have countries like Spain and Greece, um, who have high un- unemployment. And for us to be part of this project, um, that, that kind of propels this super state, we know that when the EU was formed, it wasn't formed to, to have this sort of, um, parliament or to have a, so, 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 so much power. And I think we can't be annoyed at people when they're given a choice to select if they want to be part of this body to, to okay. come out I've, of it. I've got one question for each of you super quickly. Um, should we leave? Are there any positives in your mind? Is it, can you think of one thing you're like, I don't want to leave, but if we were to leave, that is a positive. I don't want to leave. Um, but at the same time, I do accept that we have to accept the referendum result. The only thing that I feel like Brexiteers have in their favour and in their arsenal is the sovereignty debate. That's the only thing. That's the only thing I feel like, you know, that's, that's a real issue, you know, because mm-hmm. we're increasingly seeing laws being passed over to Brussels. So I do see that that potentially could be an issue. And I remember during the, the campaign, one of the things that, you know, um, the Brexit side was saying were like, oh, there's going to be EU army and blah, blah, blah. And Nick Clegg was like, that's rubbish. That's what's going to happen and blah, blah, blah. But then now there's like rumours of that, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. So I do understand that, you know, there is an issue of considerable, um, you know, uh, there's further integration potentially could happen. So I think it's just the sovereignty thing Same that thing. worries me. But, you know, in an ideal situation, of course, I don't want to leave. Okay, yeah. I've got to do some fact checking. Go on. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the EU army, defense policy in the EU requires unanimity. So we could never be forced into an EU army because it's just the EU just doesn't work like that. In fact, 
if we leave the EU, we could still choose to join an EU army. It's got nothing to do with EU policy. So it was a false argument. Uh, as for the undemocratic EU argument, every single piece of EU law that the EU passes gets gets either gets amended and approved or rejected by the by a combination of the European Parliament, which is directly yeah, elected, well, come on. And, the, and the and the Council of Ministers. So that means that yes. The general policy direction of the EU is set by the governments and in the European Council. That then gets passed to the European Commission, which is made of 28, mem 28 commissioners who are appointed by the, by the heads of government and approved by the European Parliament. They then pass policy proposals to the European Parliament, who then basically amend, approve or reject. And then they pass it to the European Council, which is basically, sorry, to the Council of Ministers, which is basically national ministers. So if they're dealing with a health issue, it'll be the health minister from each country. And it goes back and forth between the, European, between the EU Council and the European Parliament until they can agree on a text. And then, it be, and then either they reject it or approve it. What would you have done differently before the result? Looking back now, what would, what's the one thing you and Remainers you feel got wrong? What would, what would you change back then if you could now? The reason why people voted for Brexit was largely about regional inequality. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that if sure. you live in Hull or Su Swansea or Sunderland, you do not have the same opportunities as somebody lives in Greater London. Um, and so they wanted to give the establishment a, kick, a good kicking and it deserved a good kicking. Um, and so they needed to see that people got it and people still, still, people still don't get it. Um, and so speaking to people in those areas, which is what we spent the last two years, well, the past year and a half doing, Our Future, Our Choice, has been absolutely necessary because you need to have that national dialogue with people that have been completely left out of the political process. Um, I'll give you the last word because it's two yeah. versus one. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, what if, if we do leave the EU, yeah. what does that culturally say to the rest of the world about the UK? Does it say we're strong, we can govern ourselves, we're big enough for strong to, to, to deal with ourselves and we have that power to be on our own and, and handle our business? Or does it say we're a little bit inwards looking, a little bit backwards looking? What culturally does it say to the rest of the world? Um, I would hope it would say that we're outward looking. So we are happy to do business, to do trade with the rest of the world. So my hope is, as someone who was born and raised in Nigeria, is that we actually start to look at, at relationships with um, Commonwealth countries. So actually looking at doing more trade with Africa. And I know that process has actually already sort of started in terms of, you know, doing trade, trade deals. So Theresa May went to um, Nigeria about a couple of months ago and she did a tour of Africa. And, and, you know, people are starting to have these conversations. And that's what I really hope will happen because I think we just have to be a bit more international and anything that kind of champions us actually doing more trade with those countries who need the trade. You know, Africa needs that trade. Let's let's do more trade with Africa. Guys, great chat. Thank you much for your time. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming Thank on. Thank you. Subscribe to the channel here on Black Academic TV. Tell a friend, tell your mom, tell your dad, to the postman, tell somebody. And our socials as well, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Follow us on there as well. Until next week, peace.